Hi, Denise Noyura Rez here, also lovingly known as the Fertility Godmother. And today we are going to be talking about how to eat with PCOS. So come grab your tea and come join me. And welcome, welcome, welcome. And today we have a very a surprise, a very special guest that I'm really excited about. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Denise. It's so awesome to be here. It's so great to have you. I'm so happy that you could join and and share your knowledge about nutrition. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, so everybody, I'm glad. Oh, well, thank you. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. I'm excited. Um, this is Denise, <laughs> and she is with uh, Nourish Mel, and she um. Well, I guess why not you go ahead and, and start sharing a little bit about your story and how you helped with your PCOS and food, with using food. Sure. Well, so thanks again, Denise. I mean, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Denise is, Denise is actually my fertility specialist, and she's awesome. So even if you're a PCOS and you're thinking of conceiving, definitely, you know, uh, look her up. So I had PCOS, I was diagnosed in 2013, and I was put on the birth control pill for about four years. So um, I eventually got off it because when I asked my OBGYN, I said, you know, how long am I supposed to be on this pill? Like, I don't want to be dependent on a medication. And it was so tiring to remember to take it and when not to take it. And she said, uh, for the rest of your life. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, uh, I don't really want to do this. So, um, yeah, so I decided by myself to go off the pill. And, um, you know, my symptoms came back with a vengeance. I used to have acne. Um, it came back. I had period cramps, uh, painful cramps. And they were really bad. Like, I couldn't get out of bed. And it usually, it, I've never had cramps in my life. So that was really crazy for me because I was like oh a lot of women experience cramps every month and they think this mm -hmm. is normal and I was you know it's crazy because yes it is very common but it's not normal um, so I you know I I used to be on like painkillers for the cramps and all that until I discovered nutrition and that was when be I became a health coach and I put myself on maca powder that helped me. Mm -hmm. It may or may not help some people. Obviously, you know, everybody's individual. Um, I started to incorporate like more vegetables into my diet. I realized that my intake of um, sugar back then probably, you know, led me down this path of developing PCOS. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my body was very inflamed and I decided to, you know, just kind of, I don't know, overhaul my diet, I would say. And, you know, my period started to become a lot more regular. You know, I wasn't bleeding for a month straight. I was back wow. then. And now wow. at least I'm bleeding, you know, every every month or so. Um, and, yeah, it's gotten a lot better since I changed my lifestyle. So now I'm a health coach and I help women with PCOS to kind of, you know, manage their own symptoms and not feel so down about themselves. I think... You know, some women with PCOS, if they have like a lot of symptoms, like including the excessive hair growth and the weight gain, it might seem like a lot. And, you know, I'm just here to share with you my experience and let you know that the symptoms can be managed and it takes effort, but um, it's not, you, you shouldn't be coming in from a disempowered state. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you done so much just by changing some eating habits and a little bit of lifestyle um, yeah, yeah I did <laughs> and exercise and yeah. exercise it's a combination of things right? I think we tend to look for like the one magic pill or one solution but it's really many things that can encompass right would you agree or yeah totally it's very inter everything like that I would say like you know you look at your acne symptoms you look at your hair you know hair growth symptoms they're all not you know connect I mean they're all not disjointed right like women are like you know what can I what pill can I take do I take spironolactone from my acne do I 
you know, change to the shampoo for my hair? Do I, you, you look at all these symptoms as separate, but they're actually all, um, you know, in the same like soup, like they're all interconnected. Mm, I like that analogy. That's good. <laughs> like, same soup. Yeah. So tell me about your thoughts about gluten. My, my, um, my understanding is the gluten in general should be try, try to be avoided when you have PCOS. What are your thoughts? Um, for me, I find that dairy is more of a sensitivity for PCOS. I have heard of gluten also, and I myself, um, I went on a gluten-free diet before because I was trying out like a food sensitivity um, right. test and I saw the results and I got off gluten for a while. Um, it did help me. Like I felt like less, I would say more light, more light and less like dense. I don't know how to mm -hmm. put it properly, but it made me feel like I have more energy. And I would say that gluten sensitivity even if you have PCOS or not, um, it affects you because it affects your gut microbiome. And if your gut health is affected, if your, you know, the lining of your intestines is affected by gluten, um, that can worsen inflammation. And, you know, for women with PCOS, inflammation is like one of the root causes of the condition. You know, whether you have insulin resistance or not, like I know there are different types of PCOS, but inflammation is definitely... A part of it and so if you you know if you feel like you're on gluten but you have all these symptoms there's no harm to just take it away for at least a month and see how you feel some women you know they feel amazing because they're more sensitive to it and then some people you know they may not be as sensitive so it's definitely I would say like an individual um, choice but there's really no harm in taking it out because a lot of women especially in the US uh, we do develop gluten sensitivities. Yeah. You know, so it's really kind of just each individual person trying it on, seeing how you feel, see if you notice a change in your symptoms, and if so, continue. Yeah. If not, maybe you know, just be, be mindful of how much you're eating. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, Denise, what are your thoughts? Uh, what have you seen with your clients who... Um, I don't know, like avoid a dairy or gluten for PCOS? So dairy is definitely inflammatory, and I usually recommend that we try to limit it in general, again, like you mentioned, for the gluten for everybody. And then I'm not against gluten, per se. I just know, um, I look at the research, and the research, depending on how severe somebody's case is with PCOS, and they have them okay. try gluten-free most of the time. Um, maybe not a hundred percent because a lot of us, especially Americans, we love our we love our bread. And, you know, it's really, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a choice right. to really um, do more healthier, organic, whole grains, and not the refined, simple carbs. So I'm not against the gluten unless you can't have it, like you said. And if if there's a, a test that you need to have for a sensitivity or even just looking at your own body symptoms. And we do know like the if there's a thyroid issue, which is another story that it, it can have, gluten can affect thyroid if there's some thyroid right. issues going on. So that's something I think is important to be mindful of. You know, one thing um, when I was on the gluten free diet I was very happy about that rice because um, I eat a lot of rice, you know, as an Asian and I was so happy that I didn't have to like get that out of my diet <laughs> i think that was a saving grace for me everything else i could let go i'm like it's fine i don't need to pass out the bread or whatever just oh, thank god i have rice, rice. <laughs> yes. gotta, yeah. love, gotta love the rice <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> um what about you what are your thoughts about the intermittent fasting oh good question uh this came up recently and i did a post about it um, I think intermittent fasting can work for PCOS because, again, it depends. 
I hate that word, but it really depends because so like for me, I can do intermittent fasting, but not too long. So if someone has insulin resistance, you know, chances are they're signaling between their hunger and their satiety hormones are kind of disrupted already because of insulin. And so your body, you know, if you feel like your appetite is like big, you don't know when to stop eating or you just don't want to eat all the time. Um, maybe intermittent fasting might not be good for you because you know it kind of signals to your body that there is not enough food coming in, or it can increase inflammation and stress in your body if your body thinks like it's going under starvation. Um, for some other women, it works maybe twelve to fourteen hours. For me, it works like around fifteen hours. I can't go more than that, um, and it's because you know. I've also heard about this that PCOS women we have like the genetics um, because in like in I don't know I guess like uh, primal times um, having PCOS like having these kind of symptoms actually helps because you know if there's no food we are very capable of storing them right but obviously in the modern society there's food all the time there's like you know all these like modern stresses and that's mm -hmm. why it doesn't work right now. Um, I would say intermittent fasting tends to work, but if you have like a thyroid problem, if you have any kind of condition that is already like affecting your body in terms of um, you know not making it feel safe or you have high levels of inflammation, chances are that fasting might not work for you. Um, and also, you know, if you like over exercise and you do a low carb, you're not getting enough calories. That's like a, you know, a triple combination of like not getting enough mm -hmm. fuel for your body and over stressing. So um, I just really think that it depends on the individual's lifestyle and, you mm -hmm. know, how much do you work out? How much are you stressed? Do you have a thyroid issue? Um, but generally, I do think that PCOS women can do intermittent fasting. Just yeah, kind of tweak it, tweak the hours, perhaps. You don't have to be super strict about it. Yeah. Tweak the hours to benefit them, making sure right. they're not. Right, yeah. Mm. I find a lot of people yeah. that do inter intermittent fasting tend to um, still overeat. So they think they're doing a oh. good thing, but they're still consuming. Uh -huh. So um, right. I think you have to be really mindful and about, about it and not just, um, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and also in the eating win window, you have to choose the right type of foods to eat, right. obviously. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and you, what about the keto diet? I hear a lot of women with keto Oh, okay. Mm, the keto diet, personally, for me, it, didn't, it doesn't really work for me. I don't you know why. It. But for me, the keto diet, um, I find it pretty restrictive. Mm -hmm. And if you have PCOS, if you already have anxiety about eating, or you know some women are like depressed, like they can't lose weight, um, putting yourself on a keto diet might feel even more restrictive. It can trigger or develop into some kind of eating disorder. Um, also, you know, on the keto diet, you don't have a lot of um, like polyphenols or beneficial compounds from plants. Um, and fiber to help your gut microbiome thrive. So that can also worsen inflammation to some extent. Um, another thing about the keto diet is that a lot of people actually don't do it well. Like you have to really be precise about the level of, you know, carbs that you're eating. And if you're not, like if you, you know, just in it, Obviously, you have to choose the right type of fat also. Like a lot of people just think it's like a lot of bacon, for example, right? And that might not necessarily be doing you a favor. So yeah, just going on the keto diet itself, it's very restrictive. You really have to know what you are eating. And also if you have PCOS, if you have insulin resistance, you have to avoid certain foods already. So like, you know, just avoiding that and then avoiding more on the keto diet. Like, I, like how restrictive are you? Um, I find the keto diet works better for men in general. I've seen like studies that women, you know, like maybe a couple does a keto diet and then the husband loses like, I don't know how much weight. And then the woman's like, what? I only lost three pounds. Yeah. Like they lose quick. Even, I know, even my husband, he does well on keto diet, but I don't. So yeah. <laughs> that's a difference. Yeah. Very much so. 
And I think that as women, we need some carbs. It's just getting the right form of carbs. So I actually agree with you. I didn't know what you were going to say. Um, but I, I think <laughs> okay. it's, and yeah. so I was really curious your opinion. Um, but I agree. I, I think we do need carbs, um, some healthy carbs. I see a lot of women lose more hair when they when they go a certain mm. period of time. And I know sometimes that can already be a condition of, of the feeling. So uh, of the hair loss on them. So that's yeah. Cool. I'm glad you brought up carbs, actually, Denise. Because, like for example, one of my clients, she was on a low carb diet. She does a lot of powerlifting, and um, she didn't get her period for you know every month. She gets it like every three months. And I told mm -hmm. her like, you need like, I think for you, according to your exercise, you need like at least a moderate amount of carbs. And we input that in, like, more sweet potatoes and more quinoa, for example. Mm -hmm. And she got her period uh, more regularly. It's less than That's a great. month now. I'm mean, less than two months, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think it's really important yeah. to have a little bit. But the right carbs, right? Just the right, the healthy carbs that are important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we got a question that was emailed to me. And it was, um, what food decreased inflammation? Decrease or increase? Decrease. Oh, decrease. Oh, plenty. <laughs> um, <laughs> just go to the supermarket and stay in the whole produce aisle. Um, That's a so, great suggestion. Just stay right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to make it really easy. Well, I can give like some, some examples. So, for example, uh, for women especially, I like to focus on the foods that helped to uh, help the liver to detox properly. So like berries are really great. If you go for cruciferous vegetables, you know, for root vegetables, I would say even like spices, like um, oregano, rosemary, thyme, those are really great spices. I find that cinnamon's really helping with balancing of blood sugar. So. Yeah, for women with PCOS, if you want something sweet but you don't want to add the honey or maple syrup, cinnamon's like a great alternative. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, right? I love it. <laughs> and then, yeah, just, you know, just think about like the foundational foods, like the vegetable and the fruits. The fruit, just go for like the more low glycemic ones, like melons or uh, berries are really helpful. Some people tolerate green apples better. Mm -hmm. Um, because some of the other foods like grape or kiwi, they're, they're higher in like sugar. But, you know, on the whole, if you're transitioning from like maybe a fast food or canned food or microwavable food, um, chances are if you just incorporate any of these vegetables or fruit into your diet, you're, you're going to see some improvement. In, in the inflammation. And then yeah. um, Melissa mentioned earlier about, you just to kind of recap about, some anti-inflammatory or foods that cause inflammation are, we talked about wheat and dairy, um, but sugar is another one that causes inflammation, corn, um, mm -hmm. those are the, the top ones, I mean, the sugar yeah. and, the, and the dairy, so those, those can be the top ones. So, mm -hmm. yeah, what are you going to say? You're going to add on to I would, yeah, I would also add in like processed oils, so, uh, um, good one. yes. Like canola yeah, oil? Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. right, vegetable oils, like, yeah, canola or soybean oil. Um, and also, I've been realizing, like, eating out, you know, restaurants, they tend to use this kind of oils. So even if you think you're eating, like, you know, some kind of vegetable side or meat side, um, yeah, they do use these vegetables oils because they're cheaper, right? Like, they're not mm -hmm. going to spend more on, like, avocado oil, for example. But... Yeah, I mean, it's just really bad, like, looking at your lifestyle and thinking about what you can change. Obviously, it's always baby steps. And I like what you said about the whole, like, summary of, like, what foods are uh, inflammatory to the system. And also avoid anything that's artificial, like, artificial colors or preservatives. And so important. I know that can be really, yeah, that can be really hard. Like, there's so many things that are, you know, artificially preserved now sometimes we can't avoid it but as long as you put in the effort like it will pay off definitely so just a quick recap 
um, to for anti-inflammatory foods really, I think um, M Melissa said, you know, you're kind of saying the whole food section, and and I agree with that. So really avoiding processed foods, and then you'll eliminate some of those dyes and chemicals that you were just, and um, when you when you go to buy, I mean, when you go out to a restaurant, hopefully you're eating mostly at home, but we all want to go out sometimes. But um, yeah. you know, just be at home, you want to kind of make it. I like to call my home my castle, so I um, I make sure that I have really good quality food the best I can. So avocado oils, extra virgin olive oil, um, great mm -hmm. seed oil. I tried. Yeah, I've tried walnut oil recently. It's oh. not bad. Does it yeah. have flavor? Does it taste like walnut? No, actually, it's very no. neutral. I thought it would, yeah, I thought it would have a nutty uh, flavor, but no, it's definitely mm -hmm. very neutral. Yeah. That's good. I, I look at it, but I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to try it now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom with us. And, mm -hmm. uh, oh, and yay. I'm so glad funny. we did this. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It was so great. And uh, what is your hashtag? Your not your hashtag. Your um, what's it called? Your Instagram post. Is it at Melissa at Nourish? Oh, Health? so is it with, how, yeah. So you can go to um at Nourish Mail Health for all my Instagram stuff. Um. Oh, also, I actually have a free life event happening next Tuesday. Oh. Um, it's going to be for PCOS women, and I'm going to be addressing. Um, the top two struggles that I see, which is weight and hair issues. So a lot mm -hmm. of women are like, yeah, how do I get rid of hair loss, hair growth? Um, I'm going to address like, you know, what I see are the mistakes and also the lifestyle tips that you can do. So for mm -hmm. anyone listening, if you have PCOS, yeah, just go sign up. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. So make sure to send me that information. We'll, I'll make sure to post it and keep it in here so that we can... Um, people on this site can yeah. follow you and check it out. For That's sure, awesome. I'll do that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. I hope you have an amazing <laughs> week, and uh, we'll see you next time at Tea with the Fertility Bye. Bye. <laughs>